Welcome everyone to session four of our study of the Lord's Prayer. Today we're going to focus on the concepts behind the lines, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts. These are loaded phrases, <laughs> um, but not necessarily loaded in a way that's like difficult to understand. It's just that much like, I don't know how many times it's prayers like this, uh, so many stories in the in the scriptures are like th what they're designed to do is strike chords that hearken us back to sort of pivotal uh, central moments, central stories. And so clearly when you start talking about bread, anything that has to do with bread, there are pivotal stories that come up, you know, say the manna in the wilderness story, classic story of the provision of bread, even though this flaky substance, we would not describe it as bread, but it's very clearly described as bread for those people. So that metaphorical language of bread, the sustenance of life. Uh, another one clearly is the loaves and the fishes story, the miracle stories that are present in the Gospels. Um, other stories as well, the Eucharistic story, you know, the various ways that um, the Last Supper or the, or the Eucharist is communicated. The Emmaus story in Luke that I've talked about uh, recently um, many times, but, uh, you know, the, the, the travelers along the road, you know, that sort of story that, that who, who see Jesus finally once the bread is broken that kind of thing. Bread is, is a powerful metaphor. And to talk about give us this day our daily bread is to hearken back to each one of those stories. And, and one of the points we'll be considering today is that, look, Jesus was all about the food, okay? It, the gospel stories talk about it so often. And in fact, his critics often complain that he's a drunkard uh, and just, you know, just out of control because because of the way he eats and drinks and with whom he does so. So, but for Jesus, it's never just about the food. All these stories aren't just about the food, but it is about just food. And when I say just food, it means the justice of how food is shared. So we'll look at those stories as a means of how they communicate the justice of the provision of food. And then in the... Uh, Oh, I wanted to say something kind of interesting, too, about the structure of the Lord's Prayer. Um, in the first three, we've covered the first three sections, right? So uh, about God's name and about the coming of God's kingdom and the establishment of God's will. You know, we've talked about that sort of thing. And what you notice is there's no connectors to those. There's no ands, you know, no conjunction there. But they're all sort of subsumed in one another. And by that, I mean to hallow God's name. Uh, the only way we do that is by the establishment of God's kingdom. And when God's kingdom is established, that's when God's will will be done. They're, they all sort of are connected that way. The, the, the three that come after are connected by ands. Okay, so give us our bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. And what that sort of suggests is also a way that these are all connected. They sort of build on one another, but they're not, they, they might be connected by ands because, well, we can't do an or there. We can't do one without the rest. And I want you just to consider that as, you, as we go forward, partly today, but also just as we move forward. Can we focus on the provision of daily bread without doing the forgiveness of debts part or without that that sort of recognition of of the avoidance of temptation and what that means so it's just about kind of looking at the picture and it just becomes such a more active prayer when we consider the way these words work and these these concepts work with one another it really is a prayer of action and uh and i think in the church at least for me it, it, it easily had become a prayer of the heart, a prayer of, of sacred meaning, but not necessarily something that felt like a call to action. Anyway, I'm, I'm just noticing more of that energy as I go through this. Uh, but, the, but the last thing I wanted to say by way of introduction today is to talk about that the line, you know, when we talk about the debts, forgiving debts and debtors, and 
Um, I want to talk about the, the, the establishment of the Sabbath culture in Israel. And some of this you've heard of. I don't know how much we've ever really talked about it, though. So the establishment of the Sabbath, we often think of it as the seventh day, the day of rest. That is not a day that we rest so that we can worship. No, it's a day of rest so that that rest itself is a recognition of God's power, you know, because only a freed people can take rest. And that's a way of honoring God. But it's not simply about the seventh day of the week, but the Sabbath structure built in other systems. So there was there's something called the Sabbath year, that every seventh year, you wouldn't plant new crops. Okay, so you had to prepare in the sixth year, you better prepare. And there's all these provisions for that, but you don't plant new crops. Uh, in, in that Sabbath year, all debts would be forgiven. Okay, like literal debts. Of course, the only catch is if you're a foreigner, if you're a foreigner, foreigner you're kind of out of luck. But debts were forgiven in that seventh year. Okay. And, and there was this kind of just a little bit of a wiping out, kind of a, kind of a small, uh, a mini jubilee, we'll call it, because the 50th year, you may have heard of the jubilee year. That is where all prisoners, all slaves are returned to their freedom, all debts are wiped out, and lands would be returned to their original ancestral owners. Okay, this is a really powerful, sweeping gesture. And we'll talk about, you know, why it is that they do that. What is it about Jubilee that's so important? Okay, and, you know, what that connects us to. And, and so we'll, we'll get into that, how that, how that guides our understanding of the clearing of debts um, and why that language is quite specific. Now, it's not just about um, financial debts, but that is very much a component. Um, and it's built on, the, the Jewish understanding of this is built on some of the other codes and understandings in the cultures in which they were enmeshed. So I'm talking about ancient Assyria, ancient Persia and Babylonia. These, these cultures, sometimes in which they were in exile, have very, uh, they have these codes that existed that were very much similar to what Israel then adopted in their own practices. So um, we'll get to that. In fact, I, I transcribed one of them uh, from a 12th century BCE code in Babylon called the Hammurabi Code on which the, uh, the, the, Isra the Jewish practices are, are sort of based. It, it, it sort of builds off of that. But anyway, we wanted to get, I wanted to get into that sort of understanding of what it is that Sabbath means to help us understand why the forgiveness of debts. Why is this the focus? What was going on? Why is that a thing? We're going to get to that today. We'll get to talk about that today. So that's a lot of info, hopefully not like overwhelming, but um, a, lot of, a lot of data to start with. Um, but before we get into our, our reading of the, of the text for today, uh, any questions or comments that you have? from what we've covered so far? Marilyn, and then Horty. I was, I am so taken by what you just told us, Dan, mm -hmm. um, especially about really forgiving debts yeah. and releasing people from prison. And it, it all sounds so sort of kind. And I think that, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think that I, have uh, often had the understanding that we pe we humans have just sort of gotten better and better, that mm -hmm. modern humans are better than ancient humans. <laughs> and I hear something like this, and I think, uh huh. So we're better, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that really struck me. Uh, thank you for telling us. You're welcome. And, you know, it, it really asks us to consider, you know, to have these types of practices, to establish these Sabbath patterns, um, you know, the, 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 the once a week, once every seven years for one year, and then once every 50 years, um, which actually means the Jubilee year in the way it was practiced followed the 49th year, which was one of those seven pattern years. So you actually had to pre uh, prepare for three years of fallow soil by the time of Jubilee. But anyway, it just illustrates that it is not ours to buy and sell and control and own everything. 
because it's a reminder to take seriously the, the codes from Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy that claimed that the world belongs to God. And we are tenants. We, it's not up to us to trade and sell and buy and own in perpetuity. There's a time for that. But these reestablish kind of that, kind of like throws us back into that reminder of who really owns all this stuff. And oh my goodness, that to me, every time I think about that, I find myself inspired and I get a chill because I realize how tied up in ownership and preparation for all, you know, contingencies that even I can get wrapped up in, and, and not even I, that I and any of us get wrapped up in. You know, it's just, it's a different way, a different way of being in the world, what this is, is asking us to do. And so I find it quite challenging, but also inspiring because it's, it's calling me back to something. And when we realize, you know, that we're caught in a trap, sometimes that's what we need to, to break free you know, to find that grounding, to, to return to something that's more sustainable, uh, more whole, more, more healthy. Any, oh, um, Hordy had her hand up, but now I see she must have gone to get coffee. Yeah, she's answering a phone call. Oh, okay. Well, we'll hold it. When she gets back, we'll, there'll, be, there'll be space. Uh, Patty? Don't forget to unmute. I was looking up the Aramaic translation of bread and um, and then one of the things they talked about is it, it also can mean truth and understanding. And so, I mean, we, we've been given a sort of idea of bread that's bread and um, that's a whole new ball game to me. If, and it makes sense, but it, it's so interesting because we've translated it into give us this day our daily bread. But if we say give us this day our truth, our understanding, that's, um, that's very meaningful. And, it is. And, and when we say Jesus is the bread of life, the understanding, the truth of life. So that, that word lach, lachma, which is bread in Aramaic, mm -hmm. it is really potent. It is. Um, and, you know, Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. Um, so it, bread is such a foundational image. And you're absolutely right. It's easy to sort of get maybe overly focused on the, the provision of bread uh, or, or the, the, the bread that is the stuff that, that fills our bellies. But it's absolutely it's that broader picture. And I also invite us to look in these stories that talk about bread. It is not ever just about the bread, but how the bread gets to where it needs to go. That's mm -hmm. what's crucial. And notice the language, you know? Does it say, give me this day my daily bread? And why does it say that? Why is it us? See, these things are, are, are so easy to, to sort of glide over and, and sort of let them sink in. But really, when we let it sink in deeply, they are, it's tight language that calls us to a real deeper, a, a much deeper kind of reconnection to one another and to God, truly. But just add one other thing is that the, the bread in those days wasn't like our bread. It was a big, flat, gigantic tortilla-like bread. Sure. And they, they took it, they folded it, and they took it on journeys, and they would share it with others. It, it could be shared. And in fact, in some of the reading, they said you could feed up to 40 people with those kinds of breads. Mm -hmm. They weren't very hungry, maybe. <laughs> Well, but it was enough. And that's it was enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we'll look at the language in these stories that are the foundation of the daily bread provision. We'll look at that. And some of this stuff will come up, regardless of actually what kind of bread it is. It's it's really um, but but the fact that bread is something that is one of those shareables, it's just such a readily shareable uh, sustenance that is a, a powerful image. Um, actually, it's readily shareable in ways that fish are not. You know, when you talk about breaking fish, that's kind of messy, but it, it, that's a that's different. What the 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 institution or the 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 focus on fish um, is is 
in part about the reality of the um, the, econ the economy of the, the places where they were doing this, the fishing economy and who was in control of that. And that's, that's kind of what that brings up. We could go down that rabbit hole and I would invite you to kind of do your own research, but today we're really gonna focus on the bread, okay? But that's the, there's a whole bread fish thing that just, wow, there's so much, but I'm gonna try to stay focused on, on the bread today. Um, did Hordy, yeah, Hordy, did you wanna add your comment? I just um, would like to, it like you sometime to discuss debts versus trespasses, the, the word the word of debts and the word of trespasses. Yeah, well, we can do that right now. It, it's, it's something that in, in my research, they believe that the oldest translation, the oldest understanding was debts and that it moved into a, a broader understanding within the community as things changed um, that became more about the, the, the ways that we trespass or even then sin against one another. So it wasn't just about the, the debts that we owe. But I find that the word debts, while it does for some seem to be so oh, fiduciary, but the truth is when we really get behind that and look at it, what was happening in the time of Jesus and in the centuries before when Rome came in, and you had these puppet kings like Herod Antipas and, and the, these, these people who were trying to rebuild the economy to both appeal to Rome and what Rome wanted. Rome wants production. Rome wants taxes. Rome wants to make money. And then also try to appeal to the peasant class and try to keep the, the, the economy in Israel working. It becomes a real tension between who owns what and who is owned by whom. And so these stories kind of draw us, they, they draw us into that tension and they establish that none of this belongs to Herod, none of it belongs to Caesar, all of it belongs to God. That's really the intention of these stories, to draw us back to that stuff. So the, the debt's focus is really about naming what's really going on in that economy that creates this kind of ongoing slavery uh, within people. Because what you'd see is, and you've seen this modern days too, you'd see these, these sort of small landowners, these small farmers who then would, would get into debt. And the more debt they got into, they'd have to sell off their land and eventually they'd become tenant farmers on what used to be their own land. And then they'd become day laborers because their debt would get so bad, they'd have to, you know, they'd have to keep, the, the cycle of poverty would continue. And this is part of what they were seeing as the economy was shifting in those centuries before and in the time of Jesus, okay? There's a big word that talks about this called latifundialization. It's a fun word to say. Again, there's so many different rabbit holes, but, but that's part of what's happening underneath the surface of this stuff. There's this economy that's, that's happening and the tension between the empire of Rome and the old subsistence economy that worked very well for the people for a long time, but then it gets screwed up when you know when you when you bring the haves with the have-nots and and you bring in the wealth that Rome um, had and what they demanded. So I hope that clarifies it. I I, I sometimes thank you say, thank you because it's always been a, a mystery. Okay, I say to myself, I'm not gonna. I don't want to talk too much about this, and then I just yeah, I talk too much about it. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, any other questions or comments? Okay, sorry, I'll I'll stop apologizing for talking you, you, never, <laughs> you, you never talk too much it's always wonderful yeah. any other questions or comments before we go into reading the um the texts for today and then i want to share that the part of the hammurabi code which is not very long but um and just for the sake i did fix the uh the share screen thing so that was i figured out what happened last week so hopefully this will work fine today but let's go ahead and uh Can i just say one teeny little thing Oh, sure. Go ahead, good Marilyn. Thing about you and your talking. If you didn't have good things to say, then we would agree with you. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> but what you say is so valuable and not something that I personally, most of the time, have ever encountered anywhere else. Well, thank you. I, I guess I, I don't apologize because I don't think what I'm saying has value. I guess I'm just aware of sometimes we have to make uh, choices and, and I'm not 
trying to be comprehensive in my approach to these texts because there are so many paths. And so I just want to be aware and sensitive not to open up too many containers of, of meaning that then might kind of dilute the impact of, of what I, where I'm trying to focus. But thank you for saying that. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll stop um, apologizing for it as long as people feel like they're more clear than uh, confused <laughs> by what I'm adding here. But um, let's look at the, the text for today. Again, they're very simple. Um, I will just read them through because it's, again, because they're so short, but the NRSV, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That sounds very familiar. I grew up with the King James Version, which is give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Very connected, not, not too much difference there. Then I like to include the message, Eugene Peterson's version, which always adds a nice flavor. Keep us alive with three square meals. That is very sort of meal uh, physical um, focused in that interpretation. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. So it takes it to that broader place, still about forgiveness, but moves it outside of the bounds of, of say, debts. And then there's this beautiful Aramaic version from the prayers of the cosmos. Grant what we need each day in bread and insight, mm. substance for the call of growing life. Erase the inner marks our failures make just as we scrub our hearts of others' faults. Again, it's just so poetic and it captures so much more than the English often can. Um, and I think that, that gives some good insight here uh, into, I love that grant our, uh, the bread and the insight, you know, that which feeds us from the outside and that which feeds us from within. Um, so beautifully, beautifully stated. And this, this, this material will be available for you to, to kind of reread and consider um, as we move forward. This is the Hammurabi code I was referring to. This is again from 12th century BCE. It's very old, but it's it's an idea that was very common in these ancient cultures. And, and Israel picked up on this clearly. There was some sort of you know development that, that came through these types of codes. This is what this little part of it says. If anyone fail to meet a claim for debt and sell himself, his wife, his son and daughter, for money or give them away to forced labor, they shall work for three years in the house of the man who bought them or the proprietor. And in the fourth year, they shall be set free. And, and the intention of that was knowing that if you lose your property, if you become so enslaved to debt that you got to sell yourself in order, you know, that's how people did it. You know, if, if, if you were indebted, that was what you ended up needing to do is basically put yourself in indentured forced service. But no matter how great the debt, no matter what you know what you did to get there, three years is all it was. That's it, and then you're free to start over again. Okay, in Israel it was six years, and then you're free. And I think I, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why it is that way. Other than the number seven is that sort of number of wholeness within um, within that culture, and so that could be part of it. There are other cultures that did four years of indentured service and then you're free. But this was a thing. This was something that was very important. And it's, it's, it's worthy of consideration as to why. What is it that that reflects? And I think it does once again pick up on that, that way that these stories are trying to communicate that when God's way is held, um, people are, are sort of lifted up or put back on more equal footing with one another. That it's not just about uh, providing the bread that takes care of only today, but it's about uh, at points to, to re, rebalance things, okay? Any comments or questions about, about what we read or, or that Hammurabi code? Okay. I want to ask us then to, to, to begin considering this, um, the bread thing. I want to just briefly read, it won't take too long, want to re revisit the manna story. 
okay, the manna in the wilderness. It's Exodus 16. And as we read this, okay, and I will ask for volunteers for this one. Um, as we read this, I want you to sort of be thinking about what does this manna story teach us about the meaning of daily bread? Okay. So can I have, I don't know, two volunteers. I don't think it's going to be too long. I'm going to skip around. I'll, I'll tell you which verses to read, but can I have two volunteers for reading? There's Carol and Ferris Bueller. Okay. Um, all right, Patty. So I will tell Carol, I'll have you start. Let's see, we're doing, we're doing this one, but Exodus. Here we go. So start with verses four and five, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna move it down a bit. And Carol, you can go ahead first. Sorry. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other day. Okay. And then we're going to pick up again at verse, we're going to go through verse four. Uh, start at verse 14. Could you read uh, the next two verses, Carol, and then I'll have Patty jump in. So you just read 14 and 15. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Thank you. And Patty, could you do 16 to 26? This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, and Omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more and some less. But when they measured it with an omar, the, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, as much as each needed, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. Uh, through 26. Excuse me. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses commanded them and it did not become foul and there were no worms in it. And Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be no none. All right, thank you. So tell me, what are some of the ways that that story communicates uh, what, how it teaches us about daily bread. And the, the, the provision of daily bread, not just daily bread itself, but the provision of it. Barbara Tillman first. <clears throat> well, of course, it says that if you pay attention to what you're told by Moses coming from God, 
and do just exactly what you're told, everything will work out. But if you're greedy and you get take more, you end up with trouble. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> said. Yeah. It's and and why do you think they talk about it like this? This is what's always true. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say always. Most always true. In stories that talk about stuff like this, it's because people by nature tend to do the opposite. We call attention to this. We call people back to this because our nature is not to be like Barbara just said, not to trust and follow the instructions and, and trust that we will be provided for, okay? That's what it's calling us to, though. Okay, so what else? Patty, and then Horty, and then Carol. When you think of uh, bread as understanding as well as sustenance, it is like God is giving them two breads. One is the instruction, and the other one is the manna. And they tend to focus on the manna and try to hoard it. And, it, and they don't realize how precious the instruction is. So well said. And by and and when when Patty says they, she means we <laughs> as well. Because yes. this is the this is the crux right here. God provides the bread through the bread, through the manna itself. But the question, you know, manna, its own name is what is it? It's much more than just the manna. It's the instruction itself. It's the invitation to faith. Mm -hmm that that itself, that instruction, that invitation, that provision is what might feed. And we often will so readily, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, relying on a certain definition by my own standards most often of what that provision of, of sustenance and or security might look like. And that's... That's a profound challenge, but that's what this story invites us to. Uh, I saw Horty and then Carol. Well, Patty touched on the word that comes up for me and that's hoarding and that there's no value. There is no value in hoarding and that anything, any, anything, even any, I would say doctrine, thought that we hoard and we over accumulate will really just breed worms. Amen. That is such an important point. And it's important because it's always a double-sided coin. Yes, to talk about a story like this that says rely on God's daily provision is basically brought up because the world is one where people are inclined to hoard because that's just human nature. But here's what happens. The problem with hoarding is that it creates the haves and the have-nots. And hoarding by its, by its nature is a lack of trust in what God is asking, and it enacts, it enables the systems which create scarcity, which create hunger, you know, the lack. So it's, a, it's, t it's connected. It's not just about that each will have enough, but it's about when there is hoarding, there is, there is lack. There is too much here and not enough there. And that's, that's what this is also pointing out, is that where God provides things, everyone has enough. But when it's people, we find ourselves caught in these, these ways, these practices that lead to um, this dramatic, often dramatic inequity. And so that's part of the challenge of this as well. Carol, that's what really struck. Just when it, oh, that's really strikes. That's just what really strikes me about the manner, yeah. yeah. the specificity. Yes, uh, people gathering lots and like people not gathering enough, but it all, it was all equalized sufficiently. Right, right. Yeah, I love that line. You know, it says it didn't really matter how much you took if you didn't get it perfectly as an omer or whatever. It was just enough. It ended up being the same because people weren't, the intention wasn't to hoard. Now, if they try to keep it overnight, that's the different energy. And that's where the, the whole melting or rotting with worms, that sort of thing, you know, that happens. Except 
under the instruction of the Sabbath preparation. See how it's like this finding the sacred preparation, the sacred following of instruction, that, that welcoming in of the instruction itself, which allows for the, the actual faith act, the food of faith to, to, to sustain the people. So that's what Patty was saying. It's a multi-layered provision here. Carol, did you want to add something? We have a modern day example during COVID with toilet paper. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it was. And Who you can see how easily it gets it gets real. And that is that was it could be again. It could be another good example. Um, but yeah, this is this is what happens. And we've seen it in many different times. But toilet paper is a is a very good example lately. And it was over the top. And because, <laughs> yeah, it was it was tough for a while there for a lot of us. Uh, Bob? We, we helped with the toilet paper problem. We got a bidet. Amen. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, you know, I should probably start keeping track of like the line of the class, you know, that sort of captures the essence of the class. And that one might be, that would be high up there. Uh, today probably uh any other comments about the uh, mana story yes birdie i see um i'm praying for our daily bread that jesus wants us to pray for our needs as opposed to our wants well it's it's really that's a good point yes there's there's the definitely the focus on praying for our needs but i want to focus on the word our because it's not our meaning mine, it's our meaning community. And that is so different because we live in a world where it is, it so easily becomes about our needs. And even if we're focusing on just, oh, just my needs, if it becomes my or our meaning my, we're missing a big part of where Jesus is focusing us and where these stories of the manna are focusing us. It's always about the us this, this community aspect, that there is enough for all in the community, and that the provision of that enough is part of the deal. That's God's intention, and that's what God is modeling for, for, for us. And Jesus did the same thing. He created this model of practice that was never about me and my anything. It was more, it was about the community, about the us, and, and you can't have um, one without the other, really, or, or you can't, well, I shouldn't say one without the other. You, can, you can't do it just on your individual focus. It always has to be on the focus of the, of the greater whole. Was there another hand that went up, Margaret? Yeah, I thought I saw you. Almost. Let me see if I can help out here. Yeah. No, nope. you have to do it yourself. It doesn't let me do it. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes. <laughs> okay. When I was a very young child, my father took the Bible word for word. Now, my mother had to bake and cook on Saturday so that we'd have something to eat on Sunday. Church lasted long, you know, we never got home till two o'clock. And then the rest of the day, we're supposed to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Well, mom always made us go outside because she knew I couldn't be quiet. <laughs> and then, <laughs> well, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, then come evening, now he has to milk the cows and that is unnecessary. But all we had for Sunday supper was a glass of milk and fake cookies. Mm. I've never liked them ever since. <laughs> but, my dad took everything literally, and I kept asking why, 
And he just says, never mind. <laughs> and that's all, as far as I got. But I, I, I love that example, Margaret, um, partly because I just love your stories anyway. And thinking of you being put outside because of what you said, it's just, well, it's something I can relate to as well. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's, there's something about the pacing and the approach and the simplicity of, of, of living in that way that also invites us to, to sort of let go of some of the, the clamoring. You know, there's a, there's a famous book called Hope for the Flowers, and it's about these caterpillars that think the meaning of life is just to climb over one another to get to the top. And once they get to the top, well, spoiler alert, there's just a bunch of caterpillars. And so it, it's just, it's this way that we, we learn if we let ourselves that it's not about that clamoring to get what's ours, that that's really not what life is. And um, sadly, it takes a lot of us a lifetime to reach that realization. And so to me, these practices within ancient Israel, within um, you know, Jesus teachings, within the life of the church and, and in our own experiences, are really calling us back to not just a simpler time, not just a, you know, when church was more important and stuff, that's part of it, but it's really about a way of pacing and a way of focusing and, and really that deeper invitation that all of this is that none of this belongs to us. So stop pretending that it's all about us and allow yourself to be, to have your needs met, not your wants, not your desires, but just the, the needs for the day. And when we, when we just find those practices, when we can do that, it's kind of like a little reminder. It's like, oh my gosh, we can reawaken to why that's important. Um, now, it doesn't happen naturally. That's why they build in Sabbath days and Sabbath years and Jubilee year. It wouldn't have happened <laughs> probably without that. So that's part of the human condition. But these are trying to recognize that deeper reality in which we live, which is communal, which is God-centered, which is, which is really about um, having needs met within a broader uh, picture, not just getting what's ours so that we can pass it on to our children or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, again, it's not, it's not to judge all of that. I'm not trying to point fingers at any specific people, but I definitely can see where getting caught up in one way of being can just lead us astray from our responsibility and our connection to our brothers and sisters who are all part of this family of God that we're talking about. Any other comments about the manna story? Because now we're ready to go into the Mark story, which is one of the examples of the, um, the loaves and the fishes. And this one is also a really good illustration. And I want you to pay attention to the details here because this one also um, really describes God's intentions. You know, what are the intentions of this story? Why, what, it is, what is it about how the food is distributed that communicates God's will, um, God's commitment to providing daily bread? Okay, so we're going to look real quick at the Mark passage here. And it's just going to be 30 to 44, the feeding of the 5,000. So it's like, I'll ask for two readers again, and we'll try to split this up in half, maybe a little better than I did last time. It's hard to tell sometimes. So how about someone to read the first, oh, I don't know, six verses, 30 to 36. And new readers would be welcome, but if it's the same ones, I'm not picky. Marilyn, you go ahead first. Thank you. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. 
send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. I can't remember where you where No, you that's went. perfect. Yeah, thank you. And mm -hmm. could I get someone to read 30, 37 to 44 just to finish that passage? My hand is up. You may not be able to oh, see. Oh, I me. can't see you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> on share screen. Go for it. Thank you, Horty. <laughs> but he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. When they found out, he said, five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all and all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men, not to mention how many women. Exactly. And another 7,000 women and children. Wonderful. Now, there's a lot of detail in there. Now, I know we just covered this in the Gospel of Mark, and there's very specific things that Mark is trying to communicate. But there's also some other aspects of this story that we may not have focused on before. And so I want you to tell me, how does that miracle story communicate something of God's intentions for providing daily bread. What, what, what comes up for you? What does that tell us about what's important about the provision of daily bread? Voice? I think it tells us that if you share with each other, that uh, that's a good thing. And so it's more of us that are, rather than feeding me, it's feeding us. And in fact, there's a pattern that's more than the sharing, but you're absolutely right. There's a pattern that happens. There's the take, the bless, the break, and the share. That pattern is repeated in each of the gospel tellings of these stories. Some of them are a little more simplified, but that pattern, so setting it in that context of intentional grounding, so we take it, take what is there, we bless it. The, the act of blessing recalls to us that this belongs to God, it's not ours. Then the act of breaking is like what Patty was saying, you know, with bread, bread is naturally broken. When we break something, we are, we are doing something that is an act of connection with those around us. Okay, we're breaking the, uh, maybe we're breaking the, the, the boundaries that are between us when we break bread. And then obviously, as you named voice, the sharing itself is an act of living in community. It's very important. Now, is this an option? Does this story communicate this as optional to do this? Oh, this would be great if we could all do this. Is this optional? No, it's not optional at all. One of the interesting things at the outset of this story is Jesus is teaching. He sees the people. They're all like sheep without a shepherd. So he's teaching them all day. The disciples kind of look at this at the end of the day, and they're sort of like, you know what? That's enough. You've been teaching all day. They're, they're, you filled them up. Send them away so they can go get their own food. And Jesus says, uh-uh. You feed them. This is a responsibility. The disciples think the teaching and the wisdom and the information is enough. Jesus says, no, the point of my ministry is not just about that. This is the ministry. This is the work right here. You do it. That's your responsibility. The disciple, it's not Jesus that does this, or at least he doesn't do it alone, right? You see that. He blesses, he breaks, but the disciples distribute. The disciples are the ones that go get it and put it out there. It's this connection, but only when they do it in that context of breaking it down, remembering God, breaking the barriers, breaking through their misunderstandings, and get out, get about the act of sharing it, what do they discover? There's enough. 
for everybody. And in fact, there's more than enough in a symbolic more, you know, the 12 baskets is symbolic. It's enough to feed every tribe, you know, see how that plays out. You might be saying, you know, that's kind of obvious, but there's so many ways that these stories work so hard to communicate this, that same message. You know, it's not about me getting mine. And it's not about information filling us that is enough in terms of us living out this life of faith. I call to mind that Emmaus story again. You know, the two guys walking after Jesus is crucified in Luke. And they're walking and they're despairing, you know, says we had hoped that he would be the one. And that stranger walks up, right? He talks to them. He gives them all this information. He tells them the stories. He interprets the scriptures. That's all great. It's enough to warm their hearts, but it does not do anything more than that. Because only Jesus, only when they break bread together in community with stranger, <laughs> is Jesus revealed. See, that's what's trying to be communicated. It's not just about the teaching and what we absorb here. That's part of it, but it's about the way we take responsibility in community with one another, that to give us today our daily bread is not just about God raining it down, but it's also about us distributing what is there. And when we do that in a context of sacred community, it will always be enough. Questions or comments about that? Bob. When I started to read the Bible by myself, and I began with the Old Testament. It was pretty appalling to me, the stories of the Israelites destroying other tribes. I, I think I just decided then I needed to go right to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this reading about sharing of the bread is quite a contrast for me. Jesus' teachings as opposed to the beginnings of the Old Testament. Yeah, and, and when we covered the, the book of Joshua, uh, Bob, we kind of went through that. And what you discover is that sometimes there is that the way a story is told and the way it, it the language and the and the that sort of victor kind of feel to this, that the conqueror. You know, when you are someone that has no power or doesn't have a, an established place, you know, which is kind of where they were in that time of Joshua, you know, you write these stories in that heroic fashion to kind of um, call that out of people. Um, you write with, with that hero's kind of approach. You write with anger at times to express the anger that they feel that they're... So it's more than just the 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 stories themselves it's about how and why they were written that's that's important because i know what you're saying and i talk to a lot of people that struggle with a lot of the sort of details of the way that some of these stories come across but in terms of the the overall conception of who israel was as a people and what their journey was to get to where they they got it, it fits in a little differently when you can kind of step back and, and take it in but i hear you I hear you, and I, I know, but I also think that that's why it's important to look at more of these Old Testament stories because they communicate um, sometimes the 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 most powerful and compassionate uh, pictures of God that we often dismiss because we think of God in the Old Testament as being that uh, you know sort of judgmental, vengeful God, and while that's part of the picture, um, God is just as compassionate, just as as loving in the Old Testament and concerned about the community and the love within the community in the Old Testament as in the New. Any other comments about the uh, the mark, the miracle of the loaves and, you know, the, the way that the daily bread is kind of connected there. It's partly about God's provision, but it's really about us learning to see with, with God-like or Christ-like eyes to take that which is already in our midst and in the context of remembering to whom it belongs to then distribute and, and that it is our responsibility in community to, to bring that, to, to, to feed one another in that way. Uh, Patty and then boys. When Jesus, is it, is it on? Yeah. Je Jesus said that, um, that he didn't come to change the old law. 
he came to more reveal it to to lift it up and and it's this is apropos to what you were just talking about because the books are written by people dealing with their particular times and they also reflect an evolving consciousness yes and that evolving consciousness uh, came to more fruition with jesus uh saying we're not throwing this out but it doesn't mean entirely what you thought it meant or what we thought think it means now just like yes. you said and, yes. and and i i think that's really important here because i think we still are evolving and every time we break the bread there's the possibility for those same kinds of experiences whether they're symbolic or real that we can become more conscious of what it means to be faithful and to be participants in equity i mean the it's really interesting now that so much politics is about equity mm -hmm. but it does it's it's separate from god and it feels for me it feels ha haphazard yeah but it may not be and maybe another part of a loaves and fishes things where I'm coming to it as the one who's skeptical and hasn't haven't seen where God is in this. Yes. And so in our Bible study, even it becomes then a new reflection point to engage just what you said in much the same way Jesus comes to sort of uh, reveal more meaning and truth or to call attention back to to sort of different ways of, of understanding or different perspectives. This is why we engage in this, so that this, this very prayer, which is so foundational, might actually be, we can sort of, well, till the soil a little bit so that it can bear more fruit in, in, in its prayer, prayerness, if that's a word, because that's what happens. We do get, like any soil, like our good old Auburn soil, it gets rigid. It gets very difficult to get in there if we don't do that till work. Jesus was a professional tiller of the soil. But as you so what rightly said, it wasn't usually about throwing out that soil. It's about calling us to, hey, here's how to really bear better fruit with the soil that we have. You know, and, and then it's up to us then how we will engage that. You know, it's never just him sort of doing it for us. Um, I want to move into the debt portion here. I know some of you um, that you're, you're getting close to your uh, uh, pumpkin hour, let's use a Cinderella metaphor. But um, so I want to talk to, you know, move into the debt piece now. And oh, I'm sorry. You know what, Boyce, you had added your hand up. I, I didn't want to skip over you. Did you want to add something to that last? Oh, question? there were just a couple of things that I noticed. One was that. Um, as um, Jesus was going to the place that he was going to give this sermon, um, he took with him a group of people in the boat. But there are all kinds of people that just, hey, let's go. And so to me, it says anybody in any style of life or tribe or whatever was welcome uh, to that. And so that's a theme that seems to be going on in a lot of the New Testament. This is for everybody, not just for a select group of people. And the other thing that yeah. uh, I noticed was he bro broke them up into smaller groups, which to me meant that that sharing was more intimate than just 5,000 people trying to share, but that smaller groups would uh, gather and, and share and they were made up of people from all walks of life. Yeah, and I really, I think you're picking up on something that's, it, it kind of picks up on what Patty was saying too, that part of Jesus' reflection point here was to broaden the whole understanding of who was included in this broad, this family of God, that it was beyond the bounds of, say, of bloodlines within Israel. And all of these gospel stories keep breaking down those barriers. You're absolutely right. And there's this sense that people are just coming in from everywhere. and in Jesus' mind, they're welcome. Uh, in the mind of the leadership and actually in Mark, often the disciples, it's a different story, but that's part of the tension. And that's how the learning, the reflection happens by putting us in, in, in contact with you know, those places where we, where we need to be uh, sh shifted or trans find transformation in our understanding. I was glad to see that Patty added females into the... Uh... 
Yes. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, we, we all try to remember to do that when we talk about those bloves and fishes story. Yeah, they only count the men. So. Okay. Um, Horty. <clears throat> the word, <clears throat> excuse me, the word that comes up for me in digesting more of what Patty said is the word expand that we are, we can invite the expansion of our consciousness. What more can this say to me? What more can this teach me? Yeah. What yeah. more might I embrace? What, how can I limit my limitations? Just the, the sense of expansion. And um, voice set out to, and I don't know how many people, but almost something that I would like to have added to this, to the recording and presentation of this, he sent out a quote, a lengthy quote from Carl Sagan as the astronauts were turning away and just the minusculization of our concerns and worries and fights and the things we've done in the name of our own sense of seeking power. <clears throat> and that's a whole different thing, but the yeah, idea yeah. of inviting myself to continually expand in my understanding, my willingness to let go of what I thought was correct. And but I think <laughs> it is connected what you just said in that, in that the practice of, of deepening our appreciation of what this prayer could mean or widening, you know, or, or, or engaging in those practices that reconnect us to a world that belongs to God first and not us, invites us to that place of humility that allows us to see with deeper clarity or deeper connection uh, the lives that we li live every day. And that to me is, um, that's part of the, the epic, the hero's journey of this life. Um, too many don't do that. And I think it's not only to their own detriment, but it's to the detriment of all. And so when, when we can find a way to break through that and kind of reconnect to this deeper vision for what it means to be uh, a part of this, this world, which is truly a speck in the grand scheme of the universe, but is still a very vital and important world because you know we believe in a creator that knows and loves and names every hair on every body kind of thing you know so there's that attention to that detail that allows us to still feel connected as paul says we are heirs to that family so we are a part of this greater picture however small we might be but that balanced view we often lose sight of so i hope that that this that's what this work is is calling us back to so when we look at the word debt, then, you know, we, we have, well, maybe there's another word that we can kind of learn how to have a more balanced view about, because we do tend to, as I was saying earlier, you focus on the sort of fiduciary aspects of debt. But having said that, I think it's important not to shy away from the realities uh, and the importance of, of how debt, like debt, debt, you know, monetary debt, what that, what that creates. OK, um, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, debt is tied very closely to slavery. That when we become in debt, we become enslaved. And now so so thinking, uh, accepting that that financial monetary debt can lead to slavery. I'll ask you then to think of what are ways. Beyond debt, maybe but I guess it's all connected to debt on a broader level. What are other ways you can think of that we become enslaved? What are the ways we become enslaved to things? And what do you think is one of, what, what, what are the most powerful means? Uh, uh, I guess, what, what's the most powerful slaveries that you can think of? Voice and then Horty? Well, money comes to mind right away. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think sex also. Yep. Combination of the two really is uh, interesting. And what is that? What is the? What is it behind those? It's power. A lot of times, those represent power. Um, and you know, when we talk about you know, different ways that money and debt uh, can create uh, enslavement. Uh, oftentimes you'll see it has to do with interest rates and that in credit cards and that kind of thing, the way we can get tied up in our debt, which then creates um, a lot of slavery in that sense. Yeah, Horty? Uh, 
power itself oh. also, I think, I, I remember a sociology class that I had and it talked about rich people. They get rich and rich and rich and they have a lot of power, but where do they go when they become so wealthy, like a billionaire or a millionaire? The next thing is politics. And so you see a lot of very wealthy people going into politics because it gives them more power. Well, yeah, and there's a connection between the structures of this world and the systems that, that govern and guide it and the ma maintenance of some of those uh, differential or uh, the, diff the, the power differences that you're describing. So yeah, there is a longstanding connection there. Horty, did you have your hand up too? Okay. It feels to me like the greatest slavery is to that of meaning that we attribute to anything because nothing really has value except the meaning that we give it. Yeah. A dollar bill is a piece of paper. And if we give power, if we give meaning to something, then we empower that set of values, that value in that thing. It has no intrinsic value. Yes. So well said. And again, so that I love that because that sense of the enslavement to meaning Who's meaning? Who's who's valuing of a certain thing? You know, the the Lord's Prayer itself is inviting us to stay rooted in a certain understanding of whose meaning and whose value we we br allow in. You know, to to be our own. And God's God's system is just different than human system. And again, all these stories that, that call us to be a certain way so specifically are written that way because our tendency and, and the practice within humanity is often quite the opposite. And so that's why we have these laws, these rules, these, these practices. But yeah, meaning is a big way we're enslaved. The meaning we assign. And I'll also add the other side of that coin is the meaninglessness of, of our lives. And the way we seek to fill the void within ourselves sometimes, and I'm getting a little existential, I know that, but the void that then we get, we fill by our gadgets, food, television, you name it, that stuff that we use to fill that sense of emptiness or meaninglessness, okay? So it's where we locate that. And, and that's a numbing effect. That, that numbs us. You know, it doesn't really add deeper meaning, but it does numb us. It, it, it takes some of the pain away. These are all ways that we are enslaved. But when you look at the, the forgiveness of the debts that this prayer is talking about, it is a, it's seeking to liberate us from all of that stuff. That's what it's trying to do. But it also recognizes that it can't do it for us. We are a part, we are participants, we are collaborators with God here. This prayer tells us that we are collaborators with God. So it's never about give us my daily bread or give me my daily bread. No, give us our daily bread. And how does that happen? Stories like we just said, saw, it, it comes up with, through uh, prayerful awareness and, and, and equitable distribution and responsibility for the fact that my life as an heir of God is tied to your life as an heir of God. We, when we're created in God's image, that's just a given. And how yet we lose sight of that because we live in, in, in ways that are much more individual focused or fear focused or scarcity focused. Um, it's, it's hard to keep this stuff in mind and to really be guided by it. Patty? I think that um, our culture. It uh, it went back to mute for some reason. There you go. I think our culture supports um, getting tied down to something, uh, to a lot of things, and and that's what's comfortable. That at least it is. Uh, There's something that I work with in myself, because in those times when. I have had experiences where I'm surprised by God, 
that's scary. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's like having no feet on the ground. It's not understanding in the way I've always understood. And, um, and, and I think that when we approach, when I have approached a couple of moments like that in my life, I, um, I don't know what to do with it. I don't even <laughs> want to see it. <laughs> I don't want to see it. And I, the only thing that I can give as an example is that I have a daughter who has a bone disease. She has osteogenesis imperfecta. She's had over 400 fractures and twice she almost died. When she was 10, she, I was a Catholic at that time and she had the last rites because she was gonna die. And her friend, Lisa, it was on Halloween. Her friend, Lisa came to visit her and Sophie had been unconscious for two days and she, when Lisa came into the room and talked to Sophie, she opened her eyes and this energy went between them. All of us saw it. Yeah. And she said to her, I needed you. And I asked Sophie later if she saw anything when she was unconscious. And she said, oh yeah, I was in this place where it was all dark and it was, there was no up and there's no down. And I said to God, I'm bored here. And I don't want to stay here and you either take me to heaven or send me back. <laughs> this is a 10 year old. <laughs> and she's really in that place of trusting God in a very sweet way. And she said, then I could see up and I could see Lisa and I had to swim up there. She's totally broken. I mean, most of the bones in her body broke. And that light In the midst of that beautiful story, Patty, it seems that you've uh, um, that your screen is frozen there. Um, but thank you, thank you for that. Um, as hearing it go to a lot of beautiful places here, of connecting us to that that vision, that picture of our lives that's way bigger than than our circumstances and our fears. And how, and it's just, yeah, I'll oh, go ahead. I believe you're back it's on. A, it's an experience that is, um, it's uncomfortable, but it's yes. amazing. Yes. You know, it's just uncomfortable and amazing. And you don't know when it might happen again. <laughs> and if you're ready for it, you know, just. It can be, to... yeah, it is. It can be uncomfortable. And I think to live in freedom and anticipation of that type of, of being open to the engagement and the connection and the, and the experience of the spirit of God that can come through us when we sort of break through our, our hesitancy, our walls that we put up. Um, and, you know, debt itself can become a metaphor for those walls, the things we rely on that, oh, okay, this is who I am. This is what defines me. I'm doing, I do this and I, do, I pay this and I do this every month, that, you know, that sort of thing. It can be very scary to be free from debt, mm -hmm. to be free from those constraints, those ways we've always defined ourselves and then become wide open to the movement of the spirit in and through us, mm -hmm. okay? But being debt-free is what this is talking about on that bigger level. Why is being debt-free important? Well, we talked about the Sabbath language, the Sabbath practices of Sabbath day, Sabbath year, Jubilee. These are meant to reestablish the equal footing, the dignity of all people that allows each one of us to be free from debt, not just financial debt. Obviously, that's critical. But the debts that, that, that keep us from the fullness of our experience of one another and our connection to one another and then God. That's, that's, that debt can be, you know, when we really think about it, you know, what would living free of debts look like for me? You know, Patty named a powerful example. Some of us, you know, start with the monetary thing. Consider that within yourselves. What would being living free of debt look like for you? What would it feel like? Is there, I'm not expecting a response, but is there someone that had like something pop up when I said that, when I asked the question? 
It gets deep, I know. <laughs> but this is what it's inviting us to, to consider. Ordi, and then Margaret. What comes up for me is activities that I take on that delay the important, dealing with the urgent instead of the important. Mm -hmm. And trying to get something organized, <clears throat> something completed, something finished, so that then I can get to something that's important. Um, my <clears throat> own metaphor would be that um, I need to, I would like to finish the organization of <clears throat> books and recipes before I give myself permission to garden. Yes. yes. We all have those lists. We all have, we all create those urgencies within our lives. Now, look, sometimes there's good reason for it, but a lot of times the things we value or name as urgent or crisis or what we must do are simply a reliance on a definition of ourselves that keeps us from really being free. It always keeps us locked in this prison of the lists and the to-do and this is who I am and this is what needs to get done. This is who I need to be first, you know, all that stuff. It just is worth looking at. I'm not going to be here to tell you, okay, you need to do this and you need to do that. Just look at the ways that you are indebted and indebted and, and, and defined and constrained by that definition and then not free to be responsive and receptive to the movement of God's spirit in your life. Maybe it's exactly what Hordy needs to be to get into gardening and let that darn recipe book go. Maybe she needs to get it done first. To, a, to allow yourself, though, the freedom to like look at it instead of staying stuck in those places where we just keep insisting and thereby stay imprisoned to some type of indebtedness maybe to herself, to her sense of who she is or what she should be doing, all these things. You see how this connects? Creating perfection. I can get yeah. up in the morning and say, <clears throat> today's a great day, I'm gonna go garden. <clears throat> so then I think, well, I should make the bed first. Well, I should put in a load of laundry. Well, I could whip up that recipe for dinner. And then, well, I really should clean up the refrigerator. And oh, now the laundry's done, I need to put it in the dryer. And it's seven o'clock at night. And I haven't left the house because I've been walking across the house improving what's already just fine. Yeah. But trying to make it better. Right. Because uh -huh. I'm um, ensnared in that role. And sometimes it, it just, we need to be able to see that. Because look, you can do all those things and not be ensnared by them. Uh, you can still be doing them, but it's really about sometimes the valuation or the judgment that we put on those things. So that at the end of the day, if you happened not to do or be those things that defined your sense of what's a successful day or successful Horty or successful Margaret in a given day, would you stand in judgment of yourself? That then is not freedom. That is, that's part of the constraint here. That's the debt we often are stuck in, in ourselves. So this is, you know, it's, it's deep, but... the meaning. It's the back, yes. back the meaning. Yes. yes, where is our meaning located? Margaret, you had your hand up. Well, to me, is I would like good health. I get, I'd like to be like I was. And I dwell on that. And it, I shouldn't. Yeah, and that's a tough one. Yeah, to, to because there's a lot of things that go through your life you know, that happen in your life, that at different stages of your life, you find yourself reflecting on. But somehow to say, to acknowledge them without being enslaved to them or, or held back by them or, or held only in fear by them, you know, I think that's, that's where the, the, the rub is, you know, that you can, you can think about that, you can be in that and yet not be enslaved to it or constrained by it. But that's ultimately the, the practice of not only forgiving, uh, being forgiven in ourselves of those debts, being freed from those debts, but the prayer that we pray is about ensuring and pledging that we will 
forgive those debts in other people, that we will continue to pay it forward, that my sense of forgiveness and re release from whatever debt or prison or constraint that I am or have is not simply about me. It's always tied up in the freedom of others around me to do and to be and to have the same. We can't control that they have it, but we sure can play a part and make it our responsibility to spread it, to, to practice it. You know, and that's what it's saying. You're not, it's not up to me to decide for you if you're free, but I can let go of those debts that you that that are held by you for, for me. I can do that. I can pay that forward. And if we all do that, that then recognizes that whole thing we talked about at the beginning, that none of this is ours, this is ours anyway. We are tenants in a in a greater vision, a greater vineyard that is not ours to own or to control or to to hold for ourselves. What a beautiful way to to sort of express, you know, the, the, the way the prayer names that. It's just a beautiful reminder of that of that deeper sort of movement back into or, or, or returning to reflecting on God's way, not mine. Yeah. Patty? So when, when I think about being relieved of the debt, I think about being being really free to be myself. And, and, and I think about the Micah part about walking humbly with God. Yep. The, the humility is not um, hanging my head. It's just being really real. And it makes me feel like I'm the loaves and fishes, that, that we are the loaves and fishes. We can be multiplied in much more full ways than we can when we're constrained by the debts that hold us back. Yes, and and uh, that's a kind of interesting. I mean, to think of being loaves and fishes that are humble, and they are humble because it's loaves and fishes, right? Mm -hmm. those, those are images mm -hmm. that are humble, and we're invited to be humble in that way, but to multiply too. And it's a it's a very exciting freedom. And like bread being broken, when we are broken, that is often when we find within ourselves that capacity to be shared, to find compassion and communion with one another, and maybe to release some of those, um, some of the debts of like perfectionism or the illusions that we often carry about who we are, or who we should be and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it breaks down some of those barriers. It softens the soil to then open us to the, the deeper fruit to grow. So that's all of that and so much more. But so, our conversation today emerges in two very succinct, two succinct phrases. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. And I want to say uh, at this point, unless someone has, uh, is there any closing comment? So um, I think we're ready to kind of complete. Uh, I want to say, um, okay, Boyce and then Bob. <laughs> that whole um, thing of forgive it, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, to me is very much saying, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Yes. And it's yes. putting the responsibility on us to forgive. That if we forgive, then we will be forgiven. And it's not saying, oh, somebody else is going to do all this. I also wanted to say that in terms of our debts, and I've heard several people say, uh, they should do this and should do that, and that's part of the debt. And to relieve one's stress, one of the things that we have to do is stop shooting on ourselves. Okay, because there's another top so contender for so line of the class. Um. <laughs> shooting, shooting. Yep. No, I heard you. <laughs> okay. um, and it, yeah. you, really, you need to change the shoulds to wishes or desires 
rather than shoulds, which become needs. And then you put so much stress on yourself. Well, I got to get that recipe book done. Well, I got to get that done. I've got to do this today. And if we can just get rid of the shoulds and say, you know, I'd really like to do this today, but you know, there's tomorrow, or next week, or another month, or maybe it doesn't even have to be done. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that freedom and getting rid of those debts of shoulds. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of ways that we can find entrapment and and freedom within our daily understandings of who we are and where what we're giving value in our lives. And so for each one of us, that will look a little different and it's a day-to-day -day thing. And so the practice of grace, the practice of, of, of ease with self um, and ease with others is such a powerful, um, it's one of the ways we practice that forgiveness of debt, you know, where we go easy on ourselves and thereby go easy on others. And why do we do this? Because God sets the pattern. We forgive because God forgives. We love because lo God loves. We seek to be responsible connection in community because that's what God created. That's what the Jubilee year intends. That's what the Sabbath intends. That's the order and the structure of society that God longs for. So to seek to just constantly uh, you know, open ourselves to try to free ourselves to remove those limiting definitions that then help us to be more open. Uh, and, and as Patty said, free to be who we really are. That's a beautiful thing. And it doesn't matter if it takes you your whole life. You know, sometimes it does. But, you know, there's no need to, to judge even that. Um, so anyway, uh, there was another hand and I, I'm sorry, I forget who it was. Was it? Oh, Bob. Yeah, it was Bob. Yep. Well, this is all very intellectual conversation. And I noticed that Peter has reappeared on the scene. And I just was observing how as people were leaving the meeting that our images were growing larger. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> well, and we reach... We reach many different people than the nine who are, are yet here now. And that's the beauty of Bible study. We can come and go and we get to absorb what we absorb now. And then maybe we come back later and something else just connects. Something else clicks or something oh, else just feels like that. That's the power. And we don't have to decide. We don't need to limit ourselves that this all can, can sort of grow like a a kind of a an, an emerging as you know as we were talking about it's an it's an evolution you know that this that's what that's what this walk is every time we pray this prayer may it land in us with a newness you know a chance of newness once again dan thanks for expanding us thank you for being <laughs> such wonderful soil that is uh, so ready to be tilled We'll continue to do it in our final session of this study uh, next time, and that will be the lead us not into temptation, and then we'll cover the doxological ending um, that's in uh, Matthew's. So until then, friends, I hope you're all uh, stay inspired and stay well in the peace of Christ. Okay, thank you. Amen.